Hello, welcome to Texas Cooking. We're going to start this series of films off about beer. Now, this very first one is going to be about how to make a beer, and we're going to show you in just a little bit. But this is about home brewing. It's no different than cooking anything else, except the fruits of your labor, they can be so very good. So what we're going to do, I want to teach you how to brew this right here. And trust me, this one is a very good pale ale. It's easy to make at home. So if you want to learn how to make beer, if you want to learn how to do this, give it a shot. Watch this video. Watch the series of videos and you'll learn a lot more. Before we start making our beer, I wanted to show you basically what we're going to be using in the way of uh, products to make a beer. Simply put, beer is a combination of barley, hops, water, and yeast. Okay, that's all it is. Now it's how you combine these that you get different kinds of beers. Also, in how the different barleys are roasted. If you'll notice here, some of these barleys go from a very dark to medium, light, and very light colors. And these are different types of roasts and there's all kinds of different roasted barleys and there's two row barley, six row barley, there's a lot to know about barley however the one thing that you need to know is that these are packed full of starch and there's also an enzyme in the barley that turns that starch into a sugar when it's heated to the certain correct temperature well easy enough now if you take these and heat them to the right temperature and hold them long enough they will create a sugary product and that's that sugary product that we can ferment. There can also be purchased another product if you'll notice over here I have a bucket and this is a bucket of syrup. This is a very thick syrup and it is quite sweet. It's much like molasses actually. This syrup is made from this. This is concentrated barley syrup basically. Now they call it a malt extract, okay? You can purchase that in a liquid form or also in a powdered form like this. Now this powdered form is a very fine granule and it's rather expensive to get it this way. Most people use the liquid. You can also purchase this liquid that has been pre-hopped. In other words, all you have to do is put it in some water, boil it, and your beer is ready to make. The method I'm going to show you involves using hops of your own, taking specialty grains, adding the specialty grains into a steeping bag, and creating basically a tea. Then we boil that tea with the extract and the hops to create what's called a wort or wort. Um, it's per, spelled wort, W-O-R-T, if you see it written in a book, but it is pronounced wort, W-E-R-T. Now, that wort doesn't become beer until after you've added yeast and then it has been fermented. Then you get beer. There's a lot of different kinds of yeasts also. There's dry yeast that come in packages like this and this. This one is a lager yeast. This one is an ale yeast. I have here another type of ale yeast that comes in liquid form and these come in a little test tube like this. This is a high quality yeast It's very expensive to purchase. However, if you know how to do uh, yeast and to save it, you can reuse your yeast over and over. So while this may cost you seven or eight times more than the packaged yeast, it can also produce some very high quality results. Now water of course your last ingredient there that we mentioned before your water can be regular tap water don't use bottled water or anything that's had mineral removed because if you do that then you're just going to have to go and purchase mineral to add to that water to to uh, bring out a good quality beer and there's reasons for that it helps to reduce some of the haze and other things the pop hops these are a hop pellet that I use. Now hop pellets are simply hop leaves that have been compressed and extruded like this and I like to use this because it provides a quality consistent result. You can also use uh, the hop hole flowers and they uh, can ship that to you as well from most home brewing stores and if you have a home brew store local then you're lucky. Go down there and enjoy everything that you find. 
Okay, we're going to take these ingredients and I'm going to show you how to make some beer with this stuff, okay? Now I have thought long and hard, I've really kind of pondered on the best way to approach uh, teaching how to make beer and I wanted to do something really comprehensive, not just a, a 10 minute or 20 minute video, but a, a, a series of videos that shows virtually every aspect that goes on during the beer making process. Here you see a group of pots. Now, most homes have a large stock pot like this. This is an eight quart stock pot. If you have one, you've got a big enough pot to make you a uh, beer, okay? Or to start a concentrated wort is what we will produce in that. Now, again, the, the word wort and the nomenclature that comes with beer making, I'll be kind of uh, tipping you in on. Wort is the uh, soup that we cook up, the, the sweet liquor that we make that has not had a yeast put in it to ferment it. Once it's been fermented, then it becomes a beer. Now I have here, this is a 12 quart, and over here a 36 quart pan. Now the 36 quart pans are good if you're doing all grain brewing, but generally you're not going to need something like this until you've gone on to the advanced brewing stage. So for this video, we're going to take this guy out of the picture altogether. This is a little bit smaller than I used to use, or would like to use. Uh, I used to use a pot just like this. I went and purchased this one. Now, these are some aluminum pots, and some people might tell you that the aluminum is going to impart some off flavors. Well, I've never noticed that to be true. So, we're going to use the aluminum pan. And I have been brewing beer for many years. I started this, oh, about a decade back. So, uh, it's not something that's new to me. Now, what we're going to start with is a method called extract brewing, which is where we use a syrup to brew up our beer. And uh, to start this particular method, which is an advanced method, uh, or rather an advanced form of the extract brewing, and that's where we use grains. And the grains are used to form a tea that is a, a barley flavored tea and we can greatly influence the flavor of the beer this way. If I want the beer to have a nutty flavor I can use one type of barley malt and if I want it to have maybe a bread or biscuit like flavor I'll use another kind of barley malt. In fact biscuit is one of the malts that we're going to be using in this. Now if uh, you're going to a store that has all of the grains or purchasing from an online supply, they can measure out everything for you and that's not a problem. Just get your recipe and be ready to go at it. I am going to be measuring uh, by weighing some of the grains. And we're going to be weighing it right here on a small scale. And what I want to do is just pour my grains right into this bowl and that way I can get a good uh, idea of just how much I'm going to be using. Now your recipe, or rather the recipe I have for this one, calls for a variety of different grains. The first one is called dextrin carapils. Now dextrin carapils is a type of malt which is used to provide head retention in a beer. And this little uh, beer that you saw me pour up earlier, if you notice, it has a nice head on it. So, I intentionally put this in here. Some people don't want the head on their beer. If you don't, well, don't use this. If I get a little over, I can just pull out what I need. All right. Now I have several different grains that I'm going to measure out this way. And once I'm finished, I'm going to place all of those grains into this bag. We'll get to that in just a moment. Okay, now, let me transfer these grains back over to this bowl. And I want to show you a neat method to bag these up. Now, we have our steeping bag. And this is a large, long mesh bag that is designed for steeping barley grains. And they'll have these at the brew shops for you. Just take this and roll it. Now I like to use this large one because I sift those grains back and forth through it and it helps to remove a lot of the chaff. And uh, that helps to make a smoother beer for me. So, there we 
go. Pull the grains into it. Like so. Now you want to tie it off. Just get a little spin. Yeah, that just makes it a little more cooperative. Yeah. Easier to tie off. Okay, I'm going to take this out and sift these grains back and forth through this until I get rid of most of that chaff. And then I'm going to bring them in and steep them in some water at 160 degrees. I've now finished sifting my grains and most of the chaff is out of it, not quite all of it. You can leave some in there, it's not going to hurt, but it helps to reduce some of the tannins in the beer and that helps to make it a little bit smoother and milder, I find it to be. So, that's just my method. Everybody has their own way. Now, you're also going to need a low temperature thermometer and a good sized pot, as we've mentioned earlier. Now, my water is coming up to temperature on this. If you would like to make this very beer that I'm making, so you will know, and here's your ingredients list. Get your, your pen out and get ready to write. If you'd like, go ahead and pause here and uh, then get your writing materials and then come back and we'll restart. I'll give you a moment. Okay, now, this is the recipe that we are making right now. It contains, of course, we're starting malt water and then six pounds of light malt extract. That would be the liquid form. You also need one pound of Brius dextrin carapils. Now that is a, a light malt that's just for the head. You will need one pound of light crystal malt, tin lava bond. And uh, that tin lava bond, you can say that to the person at the brew shop and they'll know exactly what you're talking about. It's just a designation of how dark of a roast it is, and that's a very light roast. It's about as light as it gets for crystal malt. Now you'll want one half a pound of biscuit malt. The Dingman's Biscuit I find is a really good one. One ounce of Cascade hops, and that's going to be used during the beginning of the boil for bittering it. And then you'll need another ounce of Amarillo hops, and it'll be used in two different stages at the end of boiling, once for flavoring and once for finishing and you'll see that in a little bit. And then also one tube of the White Labs Ale Yeast. Uh, I like to use the California Ale Yeast. It is um, one that I have found to be a very predictable yeast and a very predictable flavor. It gives good results on the fermentation. So that is the recipe. Now let me show you how we're going to put it together. I've got my temperature coming up in here. Let's see what the temp is. I have a little string tied to this, you'll notice. And that is so when I'm using my larger pot, I can toss this in and then uh, easily just retrieve it right back out without having to reach into the pot. And it makes it a little more convenient for me. Now, you can use either side of the scale, either Celsius or Fahrenheit. You're looking for the numbers either 70 on one side or 60 on the other. It's going to be 160 or basically stopping it at Celsius. Uh, 70 degrees Celsius is about a degree below. And that's really nice for uh, making a good quality steep. Now this particular steep is similar to what they call a, an infusion mash where grains of uh, high enzyme content are used and then you're placing it down in the water and you steep it and you get a good conversion on your grains. And that's really a neat thing to do. It gives you a good flavored beer. Okay, our temperature has just now come up to where we want it. That is excellent. Take the grains. I'm going to grab the bottom of the bag and kind of center the grains in the bag. Put them in the water. And as they go down, I'm just going to gently rock them from side to side. That way I get the grains fully soaked fully involved, no dry pockets. It also cools that water down just a bit. It gets it down into a temperature that allows for good conversion, enzymatic conversion. So, we have begun our steep. Now, generally if all you're going to do is just steep grains for a uh, uh, a conversion light or doing uh, this kind of brewing for doing the extract brewing I'm sorry then you're not looking for conversion and you can take these grains out after 30 minutes in this case I like to leave them in 90 minutes 
I get a little bit of change, get a little extra sugar, and get a very unique product with this. It makes a very sweet beer, and uh, I think the way you, uh, it comes out, you'll like it very much. I have given this just a moment to stabilize. Recheck my temperature. I have the burner off, but I want to make sure everything is good and stable before I cover it and leave it. And as I mentioned, this is just the time where you kind of let it the steep go and you kick back and relax. In a little while, we'll start it with some hops, get it boiling, and then once again kick back and relax. That'll be about a one hour period to boil it. Now this is a, a very interesting hobby and you get to see a lot of action and activity from it. And in this series of videos, I'm going to take you through everything, not just cooking up this work, but also how to do the bottling, how to transfer the uh, contents from one location to another, because we're dealing with five gallons when we're finished here. And uh, so I'll teach you how that is siphoned properly, and uh, all of the different techniques and how to bring it all together real smooth and easy. How to do this in your kitchen without having to do it in the driveway the way so many people try to do it. I'm just now checking the thermometer. It's only been about two minutes now. And it is right about 153. That's beautiful. So, I'm going to let it sit there and steep for 90 minutes. See y'all in a little while. It has now been 90 minutes since we began our steep of our grains. Now, let's go ahead and take the grains back. Be careful, this may still be a little bit warm. And I want to lift the grains back out. And I want to use a colander. Let's slip it right under there. And just let it rest on the sides of that pan. Now what I'm doing here is allowing the rest of the moisture that's in the grains to be pushed out. And I'm going to give it a little bit of help. I'm going to take a cup, or you can use your hand if you wish, and press down on the grains. Now sometimes they're a little bit warm. So it's nice to use a little protection. Now you don't want to just get medieval with this, okay? Just kind of be gentle with it. You're simply trying to press out the excess moisture. Okay. There we go. Close, huh? That looks good. Okay, I'm calling that quit. Now, I need to take this liquid that we've made, this tea that we've brewed, which is basically just a barley tea, and we're going to bring that up to a boil as we add in some of our malt extract. After that, then we'll be adding in the hops. Now, let's take that bucket of malt extract I purchased. This is 10 pounds of light malt extract. Take this and simply incorporate it right into the barley tea there. See, isn't that interesting? Now I'm going to simply work out the rest of this. And I'm going to use some of that hot liquid to help me out. Once I get close to having most of this scraped out, then I can use the hot liquid to dissolve what is left to make this quite easy. Now the colder this is, the harder it's going to be to move this extract because it's just like molasses. So get some hot liquid down in there and just stir that around until you dissolve it all. And the 
reason I say to dissolve all of this, you're going to pay a lot of money for this malt extract. You'll be surprised. It usually runs in the neighborhood of uh, about two fifty-three dollars a pound, depending on the type that you get and how much you're purchasing. Okay, that's pretty good. I can call that good. Now, in keeping with doing this in the kitchen, let's switch to a different kitchen implement. Let's use a whisk. If you notice, that stuff is still a thick liquid. I'm putting a flame under this now. And make sure that you keep stirring this until it is fully dissolved especially if you have a flame underneath it. It's starting to get thinner now. It's mixing in. The heat's really helping. There we go. We now have a sweet, unhopped wort. Okay, and that's W O R T pronounced wort, though. Now, we need to hop this. Now, hops are really important on a beer. They're going to add some bitterness to the beer. That's one of the bitter elements that you taste in beer. And then also, they're going to add an ingredient, which is an antibacterial. So it's going to fight off any uh, problems that you might have that could possibly arise in your beer. So it also protects you. Now, we'll just wait for this to come to a boil. Now, let me explain what we have just done here. We have bypassed a major step in beer making. That is what is called the mash. Now, normally, you would take grains like we just had, and you would use either a two-row or six row malt and that would be a malt that has a high enzyme count which would have the ability to convert the starches that were in the grains into sugars and at the right temperature then it would then turn real sweet because all the starches would be getting broken down into into sweet sugars that could be digested by the yeast now we have bypassed that step because we have used a malt extract. Somebody else did that process for us of making the uh, malt sweet and then uh, condensing it down into a syrup. So removing a couple of hours A makes this a little bit easier to do extract brewing but also it gives you a little more control in some of your brew techniques and it's one of the best ways to start. So, it's going to save you time, it's going to give you a good uh, jump as far as moving forward in beer making, and it's uh, going to be a lot, little bit easier and a little more fun for you. Also, now here's a side benefit, you're not going to have to spend quite as much money because a lot of the elements that you're going to need to make this are already in your kitchen. You need a large pot, you need a colander as you've already seen. You're probably going to have to purchase that grains bag and you might want to purchase some of the socks that they have for hops. Uh, otherwise, if not, you can just take some fresh new socks that are cotton socks, regular socks, um, tube socks like for athletics and use those for hopping your beer. Simply put the hops in those, tie them off on uh, the top, and then toss them into the beer. So we're going to get into the hopping in just a little bit as soon as this comes to a boil. I see the liquid moving a little bit, but it'll take it just a little bit of time before it gets nice and hot. So once that boil starts, then we'll on to the hops. As we are waiting for that to come to a boil, let's turn our attention for just a moment to the hops. Now, when we are purchasing hops, you will notice on the label of most of the hop packages, it will give you some acid contents, alpha and beta. These are information mostly for creating recipes or also in the future if you're looking to get certain very specific types of beer made, you'll need to watch those acid contents carefully. But when you're learning to make beer, that's really not too important. However, what is important is making sure that you get it right. 
Now what I have here is some hop bags and these are simple nylon bags. Once you start using these by the way, even bleach will not take out these yellow stains. So just get used to it. Now attached to each one I have a clothespin and I've done that so that I can clip this to the handle on my pot. Here I have a full package of Cascade hops and I'm going to go ahead and place it into one of these bags. I'm just going to pull it to and it'll stay closed on its own. And that's what's nice about this type of bag is it's very easy to deal with and I can clean it out easily where using socks and things like that are just a little bit more troublesome but they work also. So whichever way you prefer. Now on the finishing hops and the flavor hops I'm going to use a half a package of this for each so I'll need to weigh it out and I'll keep my scale out just for that purpose. The ale yeast I've had this out for about an hour and a half, two hours now, so it's coming up in temperature, and that's okay. Keep it out for a few hours before you start your beer, and that's a good way to get a yeast like that started up when it's a fresh yeast. So, as soon as that water comes up to a boil, and it is still doing its thing, it's starting to froth a little bit, you want to watch this carefully so that it doesn't boil over, and certainly do not cover it. If you do, you will have a big mess on your hands. So leave it uncovered. When it starts to break into a boil at the top, then place your hops in there. Clip the handle of the hops onto, uh, or the, the uh, string of the hops right onto the handle of the pot there, and that way it's easy to fish out at the end of the boil. Okay? It makes things a little bit nicer for you. These are the little tips that are going to help you out. Our liquid has now broken into a boil. So let's take the hops bag and the hop pellets. And if you notice, I'm going to grab it by the bottom again. And we're going to do the same thing with the hops that we did with the grains, just kind of sifting them from side to side to get them thoroughly wet. Now, I'll drop that heat. The foam is coming up. As soon as the hops will release the oils into this wort, then we don't have to worry about boil over. Until then, you need to keep a close eye on it. Okay. All right, we can just let that sit and boil for a while. Now, I'm going to set my timer for 60 minutes. And at the end of 50 minutes, I'm going to add some more hops. We're going to add the Amarillo hops. And it's going to give it a little bit better hop flavor, a, a citrusy flavor. And uh, the Amarillo hops are really nice. It gives uh, a very light and um, summery flavor to the beer. So I think you're going to enjoy that. We have been boiling now for about 50 minutes. So it is time to take our hops and measure out what we're going to need. Now what I'm going to do here, I'm going to change our view just a little bit. Now what I want to do is to use a half ounce of hops. There we go, one half. And I'm going to do this for five minutes, and then I'm going to put in the other half ounce. take our hops, put them right back down into the pot there. Now this hopping is to flavor it. The first one was for bittering. This is to add a nice light hoppy flavor to it. There we go. Now we'll give it another five minutes. Five minutes has passed now so we are going to put in the finishing hops and that's this other half ounce of Amarillo hops. Now the finishing hops provides just that final odor and just the very edge of the hop flavored edge. It's uh, a real sharp flavor and it's nice. It's really a nice difference to have. The odor that comes up from it also, the, the aromatics are fabulous. 
Now what I want to do is to go ahead and finish cooking this out and after the end of the five minutes I'm going to go ahead and just a little bit early pull out the bittering hops and strain those out and then pull out the other hops and as soon as I get them out of there I want to add cold water to this and then we're going to get a different view and we're going to add this to a partially filled glass jar and that's called a carboy those are five six seven gallon jars so I have uh, three different sizes on those and tonight we're going to be using the largest of those which is a seven gallon and that allows me to brew a beer without using a blow off and I've learned to do this method since I started removing the chaff from the uh, grains just before uh, steeping them. So it's a really neat method, works great. We'll wait until the end of this boil. I have just finished the last five minutes on this boil. Now let me take off our last two bags of hops. What I'm going to do here is first lift these out and then take a simple strainer, place up underneath that to catch it. Now I'm going to use a slotted spoon turn this sideways and we're just going to push out the remaining liquid from those hop socks. There we go. And I just do this for both of them. Now the real trick on this is being diligent and quick at the very end. What we're trying to do is to cool the work down as quickly as possible and that is to protect the volatile oils that we just removed from both our flavoring and finishing hops. That way we get the desired effect from them. If the liquid stays hot too long after doing this, then it's going to destroy that flavoring and uh, finishing effect. So, the next thing I'm going to do right now is we're going to put in some cold water in this. So, simply take a small container filled with cold water. And you might have to use a couple of small containers for this. I'm going to stop the boil and pour that right in. There we go. Now that helps to bring down that temperature quickly but also I need to go ahead and bring it down even more so I'm going to right now change the view and we're going to pour this directly into the carboy that we have filled up with water about halfway with water and that way we can bring this down quickly we have here on the floor a container called a carboy now this has been uh, filled part of the way with water and the reason that you want to fill this partially with water is if you pour that boiling hot liquid right down into that glass jar you just might crack it so here let's go ahead and affix a funnel to the top of this there we go just that a little I'm going to take that work we just finished pour it straight down in there. and you need the appropriate funnel to do this also when you get that funnel you'll notice there's ribs on the outside of the funnel neck do not force the funnel down into the jar don't make the seal tight if air can't come pulling up out of that easily well then it's going to backlog on you and you're going to be waiting for it to drain in there as air can't escape from the uh, carboy as you're pouring in a liquid now that I've done this I want to go ahead and finish filling it up. Now I have attached a simple hose with a hose fitting to my faucet to make this just a little bit easier. Well we have filled our jug. I'm going to wait for this to finish cooling and I'm going to sit down and shake it. This is an important part. And you want to get that to mix as quickly as possible. The heavy sugars have already gone to the bottom and this is cool up here but warm down here. So I'm going to take this, pick it up, Give it a vigorous shake. 
There we go. Now, I'm going to wait for that to finish cooling just a little more, and once it does, I'm going to pitch the yeast inside of it. I wanted to give you an idea of what I was talking about on the hose setup. This is just a simple hose fitting that you would adapt to your garden hose if it had torn on the end or had you uh, maybe ran over this part of it. And then I've attached it to this vinyl tube. Now they make this simple little converter that allows your faucet to be converted to a hose. But the good ones also allow you to go ahead and screw your aerator right back onto it. So that's what this one does. Now, this allows you to go back and forth and you can make it really easy on your beer making. Also, I recommend getting a Y right here so that when you're working on filling buckets and things, you can have the hose sitting outside of the sink and be able to still run water inside the sink while turning the hose off. Those little Ys have cut off valves. As this is cooling, I wanted to show you real quick. On your fermenters, you might want to put some tape on there and it'll mark your five and six gallon points and uh, that'll make it a little easier when you're filling things up. But also if you'll notice here, you see all of this material dropping. These are just some of the solids that you picked up from the grain and from the hops that escaped. And they're going to run down and settle at the bottom of the tank. Don't let that bother you at all. In the primary fermentation, which is just this first tank, the first week of fermenting will be done in this one. Then we're going to move it to another tank. But in the meantime, we're going to watch exactly what goes on in between then and now, or rather now and then. This should be a really good show. Okay, we have come to the point where it's time to inoculate our work with the yeast. Now, when you put your yeast in there, that's referring to pitching your yeast. When you're adding it, it's also referring to inoculating the work. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this vial right up here above this unit. Now this is important. I need to go ahead. Let me just raise this up just slightly. There we are. I need to open this right up here above the funnel because it's likely it'll raise up and overflow. Sometimes these liquid yeast will do this. And we got lucky this time. There it is. It's starting to come up right on in there. Now I want to add just a little bit of water to that tube. And I'm going to wash out this tube and the funnel. There we go. Now what I want to do is to go ahead and to shake this one more time. And that is to both aerate the wart to get some air in it and to get the yeast mixed in real well. Now frankly the yeast mixing is not such, isn't such an important thing. It would take over just fine, but in this case we want it to work uh, to really well get, to get it mixed really well. So let's just go ahead as we did before. Turn it sideways, give it a good shake. Now I can put a fermentation lock on top of this and that's one of these little creatures. It simply has a tube that rises up on the inside. Let me drain this out. You have a tube that rises up inside from below here. Now I put this bubbler over it and it has vents on the lower edge of it. When you fill this with some water or alcohol then it provides a fermentation lock allowing gases to escape without allowing air to come into the tank. So this is going to get a little bit of vodka in it and then I'm going to put it right on top here. And that's all I have to do. After that, this tank is going to take off and do its own thing. And we're going to get some pictures of that as it goes along the fermentation. This will take several days. This has just now begun to ferment. It has been seven hours now since we inoculated the wort with the yeast. I'm beginning to get just a little bit of foam on top of this. It's just a thin band maybe an eighth of an inch at the most right now. So right now there's not much activity in the carboy itself. In a little bit we're going to be able to see all kinds of swirling and motion going on in here and this foam is going to rise up considerably. It'll get a lot more billowy 
and uh, really ugly. So we're going to be checking this every so many hours and giving you a video on it so you can see exactly how the beer progresses. And right now, I know that there's a little bit of action going on in this right there because of that fermentation lot. It's starting to bubble just a little bit. So whenever you see that bubbling begin and just a little bit of foam on the top of it, you know you've begun. Okay, it has been about another hour and 40 minutes since the last time that I took a picture of this. And if you'll notice, it's already starting to build up just a little heavier on top here. Okay, we're checking our fermentation again. Now, this was started 14 and a half hours ago. So, if you'll notice the fermentation lock up here, it's just bubbling away. And that means there's a lot of carbon dioxide that's being released by the yeast in the tank. Which is a good sign you're making lots of alcohol. Now, if we look a little bit lower here at the top of our beer, we'll notice there is this foam on top. They call this a creosin, spelled with a K. And the creosin, which is this, this foamy mass that builds up, is a combination of some of the debris in the beer, the, the part on top there, some of the hops, and then the foam which is created from you know, other aspects in the uh, sugary aspects of this beer. So. What you're seeing there is just an absolute natural thing. That's it, what it's supposed to be doing. Let's look at the tank. And if you look closely at the tank, you can see all kinds of swirling going on in there. There's a lot of activity. The other going thing, on. if you'll notice, we have a caramel color on this. Now, that caramel color, one of the ways that you know that you're uh, getting close to ending the fermenting, th fermenting time, this caramel color starts to turn dark. It gets real dark at the top here and it just slowly works its way down. And when that happens and this creosin subsides, you know it's time to start moving it into your secondary fermenter. Get it another week in that. Okay, it's been 17 hours now. Our fermentation lock is clicking away really good. The foam on top of this gotten a little bit uglier, a little bit rockier, a little more billowy. And down in our tank, it's absolutely just bustling with business. And all that movement that you're seeing, that's all up inside of that tank. Well, we are now in on the second day, about eight hours in to the second day of fermenting. Our crescent, that foam on top, has gotten a little bit thicker, a little more billowy. You can see how it's caught some of the particles of uh, grains and uh, some of the hops around the edge there. The tank is still just as busy as ever. It has that nice caramel color. Now later on, as I mentioned before, this is going to turn dark and it's going to start at the top and work its way down. And we'll watch that happen. Well, we are on the third day of our primary ferment. The majority of the heavy fermenting is done. The creosin is starting to fall now. And we're getting a little bit of a color change in the liquid here. Not just a whole lot, but there is some happening. There we are, progress by day three. It's now day four on our ferment. We're getting just an occasional bubble coming up. The creosin has gone away and I'm seeing the top of the beer peeking through the, the foam. If you'll notice the beer is changing colors. It's getting a little deeper now. Also we're getting more buildup at the bottom here. There's still some movement in the tank. But it is really, really minimum. So, after a few more days we're going to transfer this beer to another tank. Get rid of that buildup on the bottom and give it a place to finish clearing itself up. This is day five. Well, if you'll notice, the center bubble on the fermentation lock is pushed up. But it isn't bubbling a whole lot. Most of the fermentation is over by this point, but some of it is still going on, as attested to by the fact that that is still pushed up and some gas is releasing. Just before I started this video, I noticed it bubbled. Our creosin has dropped, bare patches on top still, and still we see the color changing. It's getting a little bit darker. 
and that's normal. We want it to get quite dark. So after I rack this into another tank, and that means to siphon it, then we are going to be seeing that grow much darker. And if uh, I will probably be doing that tomorrow to siphon this into another tank. It has been a week now since we started this ferment. The foam has mostly subsided. There's just a little bit on top to make it look a little white. If you notice, the color has darkened quite a bit. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to put it into another container. And that's going to be this one right here. Now when we move a beer from one container to another in the beer making world they call this racking. Okay. So what we're going to do is by the use of a siphon move the beer from one jar to another. Really simple. We'll show you how that's done next. Now it's time for us to siphon our beer from one container to the other. Now I'm going to use what they call a racking cane, which is this long rod. Sometimes these come in plastic also. This one is stainless. And there's a cap on the end of it. Now this cap is just slightly larger than the rod itself and it allows the liquid to be pulled down through the cap and then back up through the cane. And the idea there is so that you don't pull any of the sediment up off of the bottom of the carboy. We're trying to separate this beer from all of this buildup down here and what's going on on top here. So, I'm going to fill this, the siphoning tube and cane, with some water and that will prime it. An easy way to do this is just to prime this by using your faucet. Now what I'm going to do is to remove the end of my faucet, my aerator, or if you have a sprayer, remove that. Get a nice cold water flow going. Just take the tip of your siphon tube and put it right up there. Now once that hose has pushed all of the air out and you're getting a good flow to the end of the rod, pull the tube out, tap it with your thumb, hold it like so and you're ready to take it to your carboy and move beer from one place to another. So really simple. Fill it on the faucet till all of the air is pushed out. Keep the tips together and then move to the next operation. There we go. I have primed it. Pull the airlock out of that. Now, when you're starting to do this, you're going to need a small bowl to catch the liquid that comes out at first. So, make sure you do that first. Get yourself a bowl. You can use a cup, whatever. Now, I'm going to just use a simple measuring cup on this one. Let's take this siphoning tube. Take it right down into the carboy on the far side. Begin my siphon. Stop it when you get the beer coming out, and then transfer it to your other bottle, which is sitting on the floor. Now, once you've begun your siphon, very gently tilt the bottle back. And then let's slide a rag underneath it. That just goes easier. There we go. Now you notice the tube curves inward and allows the liquid to cascade off of the side of the bottle. This is what we're looking for. It's a good thing. There we go. That's all there is to that.
Well, we are coming to the end of this racking and uh, generally when I tilt my bottle just a little bit like this, my liquid will gently work its way to one side, it will pull out most all of it, and the siphon will stop itself. I don't have to do a thing. There we go. So, now all I have to do is clean out this upper fermenter here, our carboy. That's going to be a whole different video. If you would, just check out cleaning my carboy and you'll find out how to take care of that. We won't get into that as far as how to make this particular beer. After we have racked our beer to the other bottle, you want to take a fermentation lock like this, one that is nice and sterile, and let's place some vodka inside of it. And There's a little line on this that you fill your vodka to. You can also use water if you prefer. I like to use vodka because it is uh, a nice sterile agent for me to use. It's a little more sanitary. Now, my bung, this part right here, I'm going to moisten that with some of the vodka. There we go. And I'll just put that right up here in the top of the bottle, sealing it down nice with a little twist and a push. Now, any of the carbon dioxide that's produced in the secondary ferment can be pushed out without any worry of air getting into the tank. It's ready to set up for another week. We'll keep an eye on it. Well, it has now been two weeks. Our fermentation lock has stopped bubbling altogether. Now, if we move down just a little bit, you can notice the color of this beer has darkened dramatically. And you might be saying, well, hold it. I thought we were making a light-colored beer. Well, this is, but when it's in a large container like that, that much amber material just looks really dark. When we start moving it through the racking tube, you'll see the color. It's very light. Okay, next thing we're going to do is move this to a dispensing bucket, add some sugar to prime the beer, and that is to add carbonation to the beer when it's in the bottle. And we're going to go ahead and bottle these and cap them. Now I wanted to move the camera up, get just a little bit closer shot. If you'll notice, on top of the liquid here, it has become very clear. And that's exactly what we're looking for after the end of the second fermenting stage. And it's a, a sign of clearing, the liquid turns really dark, that means it has settled out. And in the bottom of the carboy is nothing but just a, a little layer of yeast that's sitting down in there. So, we are definitely ready to bottle. We are now preparing some priming sugar for our beer. Now priming sugar is simply sugar you add to the batch at the end of the fermenting process right before bottling. That way the yeast has something to eat, produce carbon dioxide, and then it pressurizes the bottles. Okay, so what I want to do is to take three quarters of a cup of corn sugar, that would be dextrose, and I want to put it down in the water, give it a good stir, Generally, if you give a good quality commercial dextrose, this will dissolve almost immediately. As you've noticed here, it has done so. Now all I'm going to do is just bring that up to a boil. After it comes to a boil, and I boil it for a couple of moments, then it's going to be ready to put into my beer. That's all we have to do for priming. Before I transfer my beer to the dispensing bucket that I'm going to be using, I need to tilt it back gently. So I'm just going to give it a slight tilt, park a rag right underneath the base of it, allow it to come back down in a resting position. If I need to adjust it after that, that's fine. Now I can put my cane that's for racking the beer right down in there, and on the far side I'll be able to catch the majority Remove of the your fermentation lock from the top of the bottle. The, I have already loosened that uh, before I had started this. Insert that cane to the far side. And there is my beer. Now, as I mentioned before, you saw how dark the beer looked when it was in the bottle, but if you'll notice as it goes through that tube, it's a rather light colored beer. Just 
just going to pan down a little bit here so you can see how this is in the bucket. There we go. I'm just going to let that complete filling and then I'm going to prime it. It has now come to the end of the siphon. It is about to pull out the very last part. There we go. The siphon finishes automatically. Now, I did not do any readings to check if this beer was actually ready. In other words, I didn't take a specific gravity reading, neither before or after. But that's something that we're going to get into in some other lessons. I wanted this one to be a simple beer making recipe and how to do it, the basics. Now that I have transferred my beer to the dispensing bucket, I have a stirring paddle here. Now you can also do this with a large spoon but I find the stirring paddles really nice. I also have our priming sugar. Now what I want to do is start stirring the beer and when I stir this I don't want to go in a circle this way but rather in an up and down motion like so pulling the beer up from the bottom and what this does is as I pour the sugar in and it being a heavier liquid than the beer it's going to want to go directly to the bottom of this bucket. This simply helps to pull that sugar back up where it needs to be. You can take your time as you pour it in there. There is no rush with this and it really works better if you take your time. Okay, I now have the priming sugar mixed into the beer. Before I dispense the beer into the bottle, I will stir it one more time just to make sure it is thoroughly blended. Now it is time for us to do our bottling. Now I have my spigot set at an angle. These have a barbed end on them so you can put a piece of tubing on here if you wish and this can to make this a little easier. You can run your tubing down about 8 inches run your bottle right up over it and then fill from the bottom as you pull the tube out slowly. That is a really neat way of doing it, but I find it's really kind of unnecessary. I just allow the liquid to cascade down off of the side of the bottle until it comes up high enough on the neck. Now I want to be careful about how much beer I put in here. I don't want the beer to be way down here because if it is, it can overpressurize and cause the bottle to explode. I want the beer to be about halfway up that neck or about an inch to inch and a half down from the top. So that's right where I have this. That's the way I'm going to fill all of these. And our next step is going to be on how to do the capping, which is just as easy as this. The bottling is now complete. All in all, everything took about 25 minutes to get that done. Now, I'm used to doing this. It might take you just a few minutes more than that. This yields uh, about two cases of beer for a five gallon batch. And I also like to use a couple of bottles that I recycle, industry bottles. And I'll you pick out clear bottles for this and it allows me to judge my beer on clarity and color and to make sure that I'm getting everything done right. It also gives me a chance to see whether it's developing a good yeast cake at the bottom of the bottle and that tells me whether or not the uh, beer is carbonating properly. Now for the capping process I have some caps here. Let's take one of our bottles. We're going to take the capper which is a simple device. It's a hand capper. Let's put a cap down here. There's a magnet to hold that. Put it over the bottle very gently and push down. That will snap that cap right down onto the top of it and form a good tight seal. Let's do that again. There we go. You can see that's a pretty simple operation. So I'm going to sit here and do this until I finish these. I will fill my cases back up and wait for these to carbonate for a few weeks. 
and there we have them. Two cases of beer bottles, ready to go. It's going to take these about two weeks to fully carbonate, so I'm just going to put them in the case, set them aside, and give it a wait. All the while, I'm going to be enjoying some that I made a couple of weeks back. So, I hope you have good luck on your beer, and tune in for our next show. It's going to be intermediate brewing. It's going to show you a lot of other things that you didn't get in this one, and we'll get into a lot of the detail about how to take specific gravity readings, how to make sure your beer uh, comes out just right, and how to duplicate other recipes as well.